Welcome to our next little bit here that shows you how to log into our server. Now, several of you have been emailing us um, eager to try this out. You have to wait until you have your password. <laughs> Once you have your password, you can actually do the following steps. Now, I'm going to show you how I do this in uh, my system. For most other systems, it's exactly the same. Now, one of the most important things, however, is that you first enable VPN. That way, you're logging into the university's network, and it is as if you were at the university and getting an IP, for instance, that belongs to the university. Only that way you can get into our server. Otherwise, the server will just block um, your access to it, and then you will never be able to get in. So once you've done that, and how to do that, you can read on the Moodle website, you can start your SSH clients. Now in Linux and in Mac, this is, can be done via the terminal or via command line. In Windows as well, although there it's also much easier to use Putty, for instance. And the SSH client can be started by um, adding your username and adding the server name. So in this case, I'll use the SSH client via the command line. This is my username, and this over here is the server name. That will stay the same for the entire semester. Now, once we access the server, it will it wants a password from us. So we'll supply that, and hopefully this one's correct. Yeah, there we go. Now we're into our server, and we are logged in into our own personal space, and we can see that there are two panes here that you have to your availability. This is nice because in that case you can edit a file on one side and edit another file on the other side or also uh, compile on the other side. So this I think is uh, sometimes saving a lot of work. Now when we see what is in our directory, there's just this one little configuration file, that's about it. Usually you'll, you're asked for every assignment to create a directory. And as we've seen, that you can do with a, a make dir um, command. And when we create something, for instance, like this, then you can see that you have made a directory. In this case, actually, I wanted to make ex001, not ex00w1. Now, if this happens to you, if you ever want to destroy a directory, make sure that you definitely want to destroy it first. But once you do, uh, you can use this command to get rid of the directory. In that case, we'll have a clean directory again. So, what I originally wanted to do is actually create this directory over here. We have to change into this directory. And as we saw last time, we can create a file there with the nano command. Um, we'll use the same file name that we had last time, so hi.cpp, which is kind of a hello world, uh, simplest uh, possible way of programming something. And also there we are now in our nano editor. You can see at the bottom here um, particular shortcuts. So um, Ctrl A is for, for getting help, Ctrl Q is for exiting nano, Ctrl S is for writing the file, etc. Uh, you can move this with a mouse button here, and the larger the screen gets, the more help you will get. Nano is a very simplistic command editor, so please be very patient with it. But it always works. That is our uh, our experience. So let's now quickly write again this very simplistic main uh, file that we saw last time. There we go. Something that just returns a value. This, for instance. Now let's write that out. Now, if we are in the other pane, you're still in the uh, main directory. So print work directory returns your home directory. But we want to go into this exercise directory, so we have to change into it. And once we're in there, we can see that the file has been created by nano in the other pane. And now we need to make sure that uh, we can compile this. Now, compiling is, uh, and executing the, the code is one thing. We've seen that, so it's G++. We can compile this into a particular executable and a program we call test, for instance, in this case. And to execute this, we have to do the dot slash so that the operating system knows that it's this particular test uh, program in this file, in this directory that you want to execute. So we execute it and nothing happens. However, the, the last 
uh, return, we can uh, get this way as we've seen, and we get this uh, return 36 or this um, return code from the last program, which is what's the one that we executed. Now, for all of your assignments, you will need to perform the check command. So the check command allows you to tell how far you are in solving your assignments. And you'll see that the check command does a lot of checking. Now, the first thing it does is checking whether the header is correct. Each exercise in the beginning will tell you what to do there. But in a nutshell, you have to start every bit of your code with a piece of comments that looks like this. And the comment needs to provide your name. So this, for instance. There. And your student ID. So for instance, this one. Now, once we have this um, and save and check again, let's check again. You'll see that now the header is perfectly correct. And it recognizes our name and it recognizes our student ID. It also uh, did the plagiarism check, although for such short commands this is fairly simple. And it makes sure that uh, what you create as a source code does actually compile into an executable. Now the problem is that the code does not work or does not solve the assignment, as you can see here. Um, this is something that we'll have to uh, where we have to look at the assignment first to see what it's asked for. And the final thing I just wanted to show you is the cpplint part. Now cpplint is a very um, uh, spiffy little command that is, however, constantly spitting out errors, as you will see in the, be uh, in the beginning for sure. So there it finds three errors, and these are errors that don't uh, really have anything to do with how your program operates. It's just of how you wrote your codes. And it is very picky. So if you want to know what type of errors you have, you have to execute cpplint with your cpp file, with your code. And there you will then get a little bit more information of what went wrong. So you see here the line on which something went wrong. So in high cpp uh, line 6, the line ends in a white space. Very bad according to cpp. So let's delete this white space. This was the green block that you can see here. We can save that, and if we then do cpplint again, you'll see that this error is now gone. The next error for cpplint is line 7, the fact that a curly left bracket should always be at the end of the previous line. So let's do also that. Hop. Save again. And the next error is that there's a weird number of spaces at the line 7 and line 8, which is now line 7. This is because if you're doing an indentation, and you will need to do indentation. One space is not enough. We always expect a two space indent. So space, space, and then the next line will come. More about that will follow later. So if we write this then, I think CPP that should not complain anymore. Oh, it does. On line six, oh, it wants a, a line, a space before the curly brackets. So let's save that again. Test CPP and again. Now it's done processing without any errors. So if we now check the whole thing again, our everything is green, everything works apart from a solution to the assignment. So we have something that compiles into an executable. We have perfectly written code according to CPP lints, which allows us to, to um, uh, make sure that everybody has nicely formatted codes. And we have supplied the necessary comments in the header. Now, once you're done here with your exercise, for instance, and you know that everything works, so for instance, even does the code work, then returns a green yes, then you can exit uh, everything. And by logging off our server, it's fairly easy. You basically get rid of nano, find the control uh, Q command, and if you then type exit here and exit here, you're back to where you started. And that is how you log into our server and now it's time for you to try it yourself. I'll see you next time.